Do you think a person should have a license to drive a car? Of course. Do you think they should have a license to own a gun? Well, it makes sense, right? Do you think you should have a medical degree to practice as a doctor? Of course you should. So why do we let everyone over a certain age vote? We accept, indeed, we demand that restrictions are placed on things like driving, ownership of dangerous items, or the practice of medicine. Why? Because you have to show that you can use the power that comes with these items or a position of responsibility. We don't let someone get behind the wheel of a car without a license because they would be a reasonable threat to themselves or others. The same is true with gun licenses. If you think that people ought to be able to own firearms, because things can go wrong, right? Now, I remember a very special episode of Beverly Hills 90210 when Scotty found his dad's gun and accidentally shot himself. Scott, come on, they found some... Hey, David, check this out. Scott. Scott. Scott, put that... Firearm safety matters, people. And we don't let anyone practice medicine because doctors occupy a position over their patients that demands trust and knowledge. If you're gonna let someone cut you open and tinker with your ticker, you need to be sure that they know what they're doing. And what joins all of these arguments is that they involve the ability to harm other people. Yet, when it comes to the most important and dangerous social technology human beings have ever invented, the state, we seem content to give everyone an equal share. This is a pretty bold move when you consider that the state can legitimately lock you up. It can kill you. It can send you to war. It makes driving a car or owning a gun look tame by comparison. This is the argument put forward by epistocrats, people who think that only the wise should rule. The first thing we need to say is that this seems like a rebranding of old school anti-democratic thought. And it is, right? It evokes Plato's philosopher kings, whose authority was based on their access to knowledge of the good. Uh, but it also includes liberals like John Stuart Mill. He was a champion of individual liberty, but he also thought that voting systems should be such that people with more knowledge should have weightier votes. And it's not just in theory. It was also in practice. Prior to 1950 in the United Kingdom, graduates of Oxford, Cambridge, London, Dublin, the ancient Scottish universities, and some other ones, all had their own university seats that they would vote for as well as their local constituency MP. Indeed, for a very brief time, the University of Sydney had its own seat in the state legislature elected by graduates. And this may seem something from the past, but Ireland still has its university seats in the Senate. So what are the arguments put forward by epistocrats? David Estlin gives us three tenets that lead to epistocracy. The first is the truth tenet, that there are some true, at least in a minimal sense, procedure independent normative standards that can be used to assess political decision. There's truth out there and we can know it. The second premise is the knowledge tenet. Some people, and relatively few of them, have better knowledge of these standards than others. For example, someone who studies politics at university, which leads us to three, the authority tenet. The greater knowledge of these standards warrants greater political authority. So if we believe that there is knowledge and that some people have more of it, it gives them the authority to have greater political weight. Now, Esland rejects this idea of epistocracy because the authority tenant, according to him, is flawed. There might be more knowledgeable people in a community. However, they might be biased, right? Their perceptions might be distorted and that might distort their use of knowledge. Now, these biases don't have to be driven by malevolence. Uh, there just has to be a reasonable chance that they could be present but undetected in the minds of the educated. So think, for example, about your typical university student. Historically, we're talking about people who come from the middle class and upper middle class. Uh, historically, they have been men as well. Historically, they have been white. Now, they might not be racist, sexist, or classist, but those intersections of privilege might make them somewhat unconsciously biased about the concerns of people who don't fit that pattern. So giving them extra weight causes a problem. Now what Estlin says is that this will fail a general acceptance test, right? So we're gonna have to ask people, would you accept this? 
uh, if you were not, uh, say, university educated, would this be reasonable to you? Well, you can raise a reasonable worry about prejudice if you didn't go to university. And this is enough to short circuit Eslin's argument for epistocracy. Well, actually, Eslin doesn't make an argument for epistocracy. He introduced the term only to tear it down. However, in recent years, people have made a serious stab at defending epistocracy. Uh, chief among them is Jason Brennan. Now, Brennan is a political philosopher with whom I disagree about almost everything, but I read much of what he writes because he's a pretty entertaining author. Now, he says that the tenets are true, but we need to get rid of that third tenant. We don't need the authority tenant. What we need is the anti-authority tenant, where the ignorance of some justifies their exclusion rather than the wisdom of some justifying their inclusion. So the reason that he gives is very simple. Ignorance is dangerous. If we give people who lack the knowledge or wisdom political power, we are putting them in a position where they can harm innocent people. Now, a reply here might be something like, uh, we respect autonomy in liberal societies, and that includes the right to make bad choices so long as they harm only yourself. Uh, I can choose to, I don't know, buy a bunch of Dogecoin, right? You know, and if it plummets down to being worthless, well, I just have to eat that. I made that bad choice. We might also say, well, if people elect an incompetent demagogue, they're going to suffer the consequences. That's fair. Whether you're investing in bad crypto or voting for someone like Donald Trump, you just have to pay the piper if you make that choice. The problem here is that this rests in a pretty serious disanalogy. If people elect someone unfit for office, it's not just them who is harmed. Right? Think of it like this. Let's say four people are leaving a party and they're driving home. Three of them are drunk. They need to decide who is going to drive the car. Now, instead of letting the sober person drive, they put it to a vote. And three people vote to let the drunkest person drive. And then they grab the sober person and make them get in the car with them. And they drive off and drive you know, right off a bridge, killing everyone. This is what democracy authorizes. It lets the ill-informed, the ignorant, just the plain stupid influence decisions that can harm a great deal of innocent people. But what is the alternative? Winston Churchill once said, many forms of government have been tried and will be tried in this world of sin and woe. No one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. You're welcome for my Churchill impression, by the way. So what does epistocracy look like in practice? Like all forms of thinking about government, whether we're talking about uh, you know, authoritarianism or democracy, there are different ways of cashing it out. The most obvious one is a restricted ballot. If you want to vote, you have to pass a test of political knowledge. A second option might be a veto. Instead of having two democrat democratically elected chambers of government, uh, we say that one of them will be elected by a restricted ballot and the knowledgeable can exercise veto over the democratic assembly. We might agree with someone like John Stuart Mill and say that there should be plural voting. Uh, if you go to university, if you can pass a test, if you have a qualification in a trade, perhaps you get more votes because you are more intelligent, question mark. And then there's values only voting. So everyone can vote, but they can only vote on general aims. So we say we want to create a uh, fairer society or we want to solve climate change. But the way we get there is not left to the ordinary people. It's left up to experts. They are delegated the policy choices. We simply point them in the right direction. And finally, there's artificial intelligence. And this is one that I find really fantastic. Uh, we make an oracle, right? The oracle is an AI that can predict what a simulated community of perfectly informed and rational voters would choose. So this AI would have, you know, a virtual Australia with a virtual form of all of us who live in Australia, but stripped of all of our biases and ignorance. And it asks itself, what would these people choose in conditions of rationality and perfect information? And from there, we get the policy that we want. I love sci-fi examples like this. Uh, when it was first put out, I was just like, oh, this is never gonna be true. But ChatGPT, y'all, I know that it's lurking around someone's essay. And one day it's gonna be writing our foreign policy and the world is just gonna go. Each of these approaches, is epistocratic insofar as it gives more weight to the knowledgeable. They're either getting more votes 
they're shifting policy, or they're creating the AI that is going to control the world. Now look, I'll admit it, there have been times when I've watched a, a video online of people doing the most incredibly stupid things imaginable or spouting off ludicrous conspiracy theories, and I thought, wow, they have the same power as me in our political system. And it sort of brings forward the attraction of epistocracy, right? You know, you can't trust people. People are silly. They voted for Nazis. They voted for Trump. Uh, why are we so into democracy? Perhaps epistocracy is better. Well, in the next part, I might take up the lance for democracy.